Hey everyone, welcome back. In this blog video, I am doing a uh, review and test on a new waveguide that I've designed, uh, waveguide number 2439. Mm -hmm. And this is uh, a dedicated design for the Blisma T34B, which is a beryllium uh, 34 millimeter diameter uh, dome tweeter. And so a customer had sent me uh, one of his tweeters and wanted to see what I could do with it as far as creating a waveguide using uh, my ES horn flare curvature and also in a biradial configuration. Um, so let's just take a quick look at the Blisma tweeter. So Blisma offers a variety of diaphragm materials and so uh, we're using the beryllium uh, for this test and so you can see here, here's some specs. Um, I'll link to the to this uh, publication there in the description if you want to take a look at this tweeter. So the, the tweeter is uh, 500 US dollars each so it's uh, up in the upper echelons of the price range for uh, tweeters. Now in, in this video I'm also going to directly compare um, this combo against a traditional one inch compression driver and so uh, using the ES800 biradial. So I'm going to be using the RCF CD350 which is the ceramic version uh, and it's a 1.7 inch uh, Di diameter diaphragm. Okay, so I'm going to do a, a direct comparison for all the test data just out of curiosity and you might wonder why I'm comparing against this particular compression driver. Uh, I think it just represents a very kind of um, common configuration and I think it would be interesting for most to see just how a compression driver compares against a really nice dome tweeter in a waveguide. Okay, so personally I've always been curious and so doing a direct comparison allows, you know, the test setup to be the same, especially when it comes to distortion measurements. There's so many variables that go into that type of a test and so you really want to make sure that uh, all the variables are controlled and so that you're getting a very accurate comparison. So um, so I wanted a, uh, like I mentioned, a waveguide that's based on my ES by radial uh, geometry. And so this allows me to control both the horizontal and vertical directivity independently. Uh, and it also provides closer driver spacing uh, between the high frequency and the, and the low frequency. Um, so now I printed a prototype horn. The horn itself is comprised of two pieces, a throat piece, which you see here, and also the, the rest of the horn. And so the reason I had done that is because the uh, you can see here, this is the surround of the Blisma. And so I was able to get uh, the actual 3D CAD data from Blisma. And so you can see here that I've, I've followed very closely um, a portion of the surround on the dome tweeter. And so to get that level of accuracy with 3D printing, uh, you need to have uh, the axis in this direction so that it's printing flat on the bed. And then the last kind of portion of the print is to do that very careful uh, geometry there. Uh, and then the rest of the horn is printed in a different axis. Um, one that facilitates printing of the horn. So it's just trying to accommodate the printing process and trying to create a 3D printed part that is as accurate as possible. So here, here you can see the 3D printed horn and then the uh, throw adapter plate is printed in white just so you can see um, how that looks. And so this particular design has the wrap around and then it just transitions to a smooth um, a smooth kind of back to it and then I've kept it uh, as deep as the tweeter itself just so that it stays uh, on a flat surface and it isn't uh, going to want to tip over. Um, and then for the comparison today we're comparing against this prototype ES800 by radial with the one inch throat and then it's using the ceramic version the RCF which is made in Italy, CD350. So it has a polyester diaphragm and it's been an overall good performer and so it'll be interesting to see how it, how it fares in all of the test data. So I began by measuring the raw frequency response of the Blisma uh, 2439 combo and so you can see the raw response in red and then I that because this is a four ohm driver uh, it required a 6.8 microfarad capacitor to bring it to what we see here in blue. Okay and then in the Arda measurement software 
I have the impedance uh, curve there as an overlay and you can see the phase uh, in, the, in the right column there. And so the fundamental resonance of the tweeter is around 700 hertz. And then you can see here we have a, a very nice flat impedance curve and then as even when we get into the upper treble, uh, there's nothing uh, to speak of in terms of breakup or resonances in this tweeter. In fact, you can see here that the response tapers off in a smooth fashion and then we really don't get any breakup until around the uh, 28 uh, kilohertz region. So excellent performance uh, from this beryllium dome in terms of keeping the breakup well outside of the audible band. So just uh, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to show you the set of data for the Blisma uh, waveguide combo and then right after that I'm going to show you what the compression driver ES800 biradial looks like. And so you, again, same setup. Uh, you can see here this is the raw response of the CD350 and then I used a 3.3 um, micro microfarad capacitor there for the high pass and just to flatten it out and so I also have the overlay so we actually have a, a higher FS with the compression driver but it as well has a pretty good impedance sweep a little bit of inductive rise uh, likely due to the fact that this compression driver doesn't have uh, shorting copper in the, in, the, in the motor structure where the Blisma does um, so, you, so you can see here it is a good performer in terms of uh, keeping breakup Sorry, down here. It is a good performer uh, in terms of breakup as well. You don't see anything too severe until around uh, 16.5 kilohertz, which is for me at least outside of my audible listening capability. And so, uh, so the next uh, step in the testing is to look at the off axis. And so I did do both horizontal and vertical uh, for both horns, which uh, presents an interesting. Uh, I guess insight into why we go with the biradial and that it does limit the directivity in the vertical. And so here's the off axis and this is measured at 5 degrees uh, up to 20 degrees and then past 20 degrees I measured it at 10 degree increments just to kind of expedite the overall measurement process and just for time's sake it becomes quite tedious measuring at 5 degrees uh, all the way out to 90 degrees so this just um, this is using 24 dB smoothing and uh, so if there was anything uh, as far as anomalies off axis it would show up here but what we do see is a very consistent and even um, off axis now it's uh, very wide at um, 120 degrees however we see that at around 8 kilohertz the Blisma uh, waveguide narrows quite significantly and then by uh, 11 kilohertz we're at a 70 degree coverage and so a little bit of a, a shortfall there in terms of what we'd like to see we want to have wide coverage even into the upper treble and so this uh, likely a factor in why we see this is due to the larger diameter of the Blisma at 34 uh, millimeters so looking at the vertical directivity of the of the uh, two 2439 waveguide we can see here that we don't really have the same pattern control uh, in the vertical so we see that we have pattern control down to about 1.2 kilohertz but in the vertical we really don't have any control until around uh, 2 kilohertz and then we see a gradual narrowing of the directivity so by um, 11 kilohertz the directivity is only 40 degrees okay and that is likely the, what we'd want to see in a vertical and so what that's going to do is just limit the uh, floor and ceiling uh, primary reflections in your listening space. Okay so then I measured the uh, ES800 biradial which is a one inch throat and so you can see here that we have nearly constant directivity it provides 120 degrees coverage uh, across the bandwidth and it only narrows to about 100 degrees when we look at the same uh, 11 kilohertz region. Um, vertical directivity of the ES800 we can see it's similar to the waveguide where we have a gradual narrowing pattern control is at uh, the same 2 kilohertz and then by 
11 kilohertz were at 60 degree coverage, um, which contrasts to what we saw with the uh, Blisma, which was a 40 degree coverage. So overall, the ES800 is providing uh, wider coverage both in the horizontal and vertical and particularly in the upper treble so that's going to uh, affect the overall spaciousness and sound stage uh, perceived source width for the upper treble which is going to give you a sense of ambience um, so it is a factor that that that, uh, that we want to consider uh, time domain so it being a beryllium we should expect stellar performance here and we do see that with the blisma so burst decay is virtually devoid of anything uh it's not until you get up into like the the 28 kilohertz that we see some breakup occurring um, so very very good result there and then showing the same result but in a, in a waterfall again one of the cleanest that I've seen and the uh, fundamental resonance seems to be well controlled there as we see it um, kind of encroaching there if we compare the RCF we see if another it's a good result as well uh, relatively speaking to other compression drivers uh, but we do see some stored energy and what I should mention too that it, it rings out to around 15 uh, periods which for me personally I'd like to see uh, just as my target performance generally uh, I'd like to see everything kind of dead by about 18 periods so in that sense uh, the RCF meets my target performance what we see here that outside of the audible band at around 18 kilohertz we do see uh, some significant resonances that rings past the 18 or 18 periods uh, the csd waterfall again looks really good but we see just by virtue of it being a compression driver it's a little more under damped compared to the blisma and so you see that resonance coming in pretty strong near the fs of the driver um, so we do see again the uh, a small bit of stored energy there but overall it's a good result uh, distortion for the distortion test I simply tested it at 95 dB for all of the tests and so it just kind of kept the comparison as simple as possible and so starting out with harmonic distortion you can and in particular I'm just looking at the higher order harmonics the third and fourth harmonic uh, and, and so you can see here the blisma is at 0.008% uh, for the 2 kilohertz region. If you want to know how to read this, so you can see here, this is where I've placed the cursor in the measurement software, and then it produces the uh, second, third, and fourth harmonic results as a percentage here in the bottom. And so uh, extremely low distortion below 0.01%. Uh, if we want to change the graph display to display db instead of percent so i've just simply changed uh this is showing this is showing the same result but in a db scale so you can see here that the third and fourth harmonic is uh, 81 db into the noise floor so extremely low uh, result there for the compression driver same setup same test spl you can see um, as well that the third and fourth harmonic is extremely low at um, 0 0.007 so third harmonic is even lower uh, against the blisma but then we see the fourth harmonic a little bit higher but i mean we're we're nitpicking over uh extremely low numbers that are well below the threshold of audibility and the, so this is more more or less simply an academic interest on how these two drivers compare uh, again just changing the vertical scale to db instead of percent we can see uh, minus 82 db and minus 77 db respectively for the uh, third and fourth harmonic so um, so the conclusion there on the harmonic is that the uh, rcf and the blisma have similar harmonic distortion pro profiles for h3 and h4 so looking at multi-band uh, multi-tone distortion here's the blisma at the 95 db and so we have um, 60 db of uh, imd noise floor for the 1.5 kilohertz region and then it improves uh, you can see here how it troughs down uh, and then by the 5 kilohertz region we have 70 db of dynamic range um, for the upper treble we're looking at around 65 db 
Um, now I tested the RCF, exact same test SPL, 95 dB. We can see that we have 64 dB for the 1.5 kilohertz region, and then minus 61 dB for the five, and then the upper treble is minus 55. So just general conclusion here, uh, the Blisma seems to outperform the RCF marginally on the IMD by about five to eight dB. Um, and again, this is more of an academic uh, analysis since both results are far below the threshold of audibility. So um, using my uh, Vertin's multi-instrument software, um, I'm able to produce uh, the Ged Lee distortion. And so it produced actually quite a difference between the two test, uh, test drivers here. And so the T34B Blisma is shown in blue and then the RCF is shown in red there. So showing that the Blisma does outperform when it comes to the Ged Lee distortion. Uh, so the conclusion is that the RCF biradial, uh, the ES800 biradial, is a tough act to follow, uh, but the Blisma pulls it off by offering a smooth response, uh, lower distortion, and a cleaner time domain. Uh, however, the larger diameter of the Blisma introduces some, nar some narrowing of the directivity uh, in the critical upper treble where the soundstage width could be compromised. The Blisma has no trouble digging down deep into the lower mid-range without sounding stressed or resonant, which is often the case when mounting a dome tweeter into a waveguide. Uh, my subjective evaluation was brief and conducted in mono. However, I would say that the Blisma sounded excellent with just a slight lack of upper treble energy compared to the RCA. Uh, directly comparing the two revealed that the compression driver is more expressive and colorful, highlighting dynamic contrast more readily. Uh, both had similar levels of clarity throughout the mid-range and treble. So there you have it, uh, interesting comparison between uh, basically two completely different drivers. Uh, and so uh, there you have it. Take care and have a great day.